this is what I want to do. Yeah. This is it. This is speech and language therapy is calling to me. Welcome to Island Influencers, where we share stories of successful business owners, experienced professionals, entrepreneurs and community leaders based or with influence in the Isle of Man. This podcast is brought to you by Thornton Chartered Financial Planners, because great financial planning has the power to change your life. Now here's your host, Chartered Financial Planner, Sharon Sutton. Welcome to this week's Ireland Influencers. My guest this week is Ailish Greger. Ailish is an independent specialist speech and language therapist working with both children and adults on the Isle of Man. Having grown up taking a caring role within the family for her brother, Ailish has always been driven to provide a service that brings best practice and provides a compassionate and listening ear to families and carers without judgment. Whilst shadowing an independent mentor at college, Ailish knew then that she wanted to be a speech and language therapist, but initially she faced several barriers getting into university. Since the age of 18, Ailish has been working in care settings, building up such a wealth of knowledge and experience. She's always been enthusiastic about supporting each individual to reach their potential and be treated with dignity and respect. Enjoy listening to Ailish's inspirational story of how she found her pathway to providing such an essential and valued service in the Isle of Man. Thanks, Ailish. Thanks for coming in. Tell me, uh, how, how do you find yourself here today? Where did you, where did you grow up? Yeah, so I feel very lucky to be able to have grown up on the Isle of Man. I grew up in Peel, absolutely loved it. We had a field opposite with loads of trees in that we could climb. Just absolutely lovely childhood. Yeah. So yeah, I feel very lucky, having lived in the UK, to have had the privilege to grow up on the Isle of Man. Yeah, so so you grew up on the Isle of Man, you say? Yeah. So how long, how long were you in the Isle of Man growing up? What sort of, what took you to the UK eventually? So I left when I was 20 to go to university so okay. I spent all that the other you know the remaining time on the Isle of Man yes okay um, so what, yeah. where did you go to school went to cloth workers first and then QE2 yeah and then I went to the Isle of Man college um, right. so I left after my GCSEs um, left school and then went to the Isle of Man college so. yeah what made you take the decision to go on the pathway that you found yourself? Yeah, so I, I always knew I wanted to be in a caring role. Um, my brother is blind and has all the difficulties. So as a family, it was always our way to just get on with it. And yeah. we supported him through humour. He's Gosh. not allowed to get away with anything. Yeah. Um, you know, we've not sort of, I suppose, handheld him through a lot of things, but we've also supported him to be independent. So I always knew I wanted to go into a care and role. So when I finished my GCSEs, it made sense to me to go and do the health and social care course at college because I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, but that was just calling me. Um, Is he older or younger than you? He's younger than me. Right. Um, He also has done incredibly well. He's got a first in his undergrad degree. He's doing a master's. You know, he's he is amazing. Um, And... You know, I like to think that some of that is the way that we brought him up, that you just get on with it, you push through. I think that's why I'm so passionate about everyone being as independent as they can be, because everyone has potential. Yeah, yeah, Um, sure. It's just being able to see that and provide the right level of support. Yes. So, yeah, I went to the Alman College. I did the health and social care course. And on that, I shadowed a speech therapist called Nora Lean. She was just amazing and she gave me so much time. I shadowed her so often and every time I shadowed her, I just thought, this is what I want to do. This this is it. This is speech and language therapy is calling to me. So that's how I sort of fell into wanting to be a speech therapist. Yeah, Nora was just fabulous. Brilliant. So do you you still um, have have that role? Do you do do that for others or...? Uh, Yes, so I've had two people um, come and spend a little bit of time with me in my independent practice. People often get in touch and say, my daughter wants to be a speech therapist, can you meet with her and talk through it? So if I could replicate that and I suppose educate and instill the passion that that Nora did for me, then I think absolutely being a speech therapist is such an amazing job. If I can inspire other people to do it and show them, I think a lot of it is no one really knows what a speech therapist does. So if they come and spend some time with me, they go, oh, wow, this is so diverse. This is amazing. And I just, I get yeah. really excited. Oh, so um, that does sound amazing. <laughs> so, so tell me, um, when you went to, where did you go to uni- university? What, what was it? What subjects did you sort of follow to, to get to where you you now so are. I did the health and social care course at college mm-hmm. um, unfortunately at the time I don't think it was well known but the qualifications that I got from the health and social care course weren't enough for me to go to university to become a speech therapist right which was a real shame and none of us knew that would happen so I did two years 
to get A-levels and then found out that I didn't have enough to go to university. So I had to do another two years of A-levels on top of what I already had. So I did that in the evenings and I started to work as a carer um, right. with adults with learning disabilities and autistic people. And I absolutely loved that. And I think that really gave me a lot of experience to be able to go to university and say, I want to be a speech therapist and I want to work within this particular area. Um, and I've done this, this and this work experience. Yeah, so Fab. when eventually another two years down the line, I got uni interviews. Um, I'd spent time shadowing Nora. I'd spent time working in care. When it came to the interviews, people were saying, you've got so much experience. This is amazing. And it made those extra two years I'd had to wait to go to university really worth it. And I don't regret it. I think I would have struggled going to university at 18, but going at 20... I had had a couple more years of work. I'd made some really stable friends outside of school. Um, I think I was just, I was in a better position. That's really valuable that to share, especially at the moment when there are kids having gone through sort of A-levels and thinking, oh my goodness, what am I doing going to university now? Mm. I mean, you know, a, a great way to have had, which was a challenge, turned it into such an opportunity. That Absolutely. And yeah. for me... So the speech and language therapy course I did is four years long. Yeah. So when I graduated, I had all that experience behind me. So when I went straight into a job with adults with learning disabilities and autism as a speech and language therapist, I was, I'd already had two years worth of care. And then in the holidays when I came back, I used to go back to work in care. Yeah. So I had all this wealth of knowledge yes, and experience. Yes. Yeah. So when I went for a job interview, it was... Oh, you're amazing. You're a qualified speech therapist. Plus, yeah. you've already worked with within this area for so many years. So. Proven track record. <laughs> Congratulations. That sounds uh, that sounds amazing. Well Thank done. You. So you got you got jobs as a speech therapist straight out of university. Yeah. So what happened then? So my first job was in the UK in Stoke on Trent, mm -hmm. um, and I yeah. So I knew that I wanted to go into the area of learning disabilities and autism. Um, but I did have to wait, so I graduated in June. And I didn't get that job till, I think I interviewed in August and it didn't start till December. So again, I had quite a big gap, but I went back to working in care and I was very set on. I want a job in learning disabilities. I'm not prepared to take a paediatric post and just wait. I yeah. said, you know, I'm going to wait. And again, that experience of being back working full-time in care put me in such a good position that um when I took this job in Stoke-on-Trent I had just a wealth of experience of of working with people so that when I started to work with the clients it was just natural to me it was it was so easy like it should be yeah, you know yeah, we're just yeah. I spent time with the people that I worked with um I really enjoyed it I had a background of what it's like to be a staff member so then when I was going into houses and asking staff to follow my recommendations yes I knew what it was like from their side to have OTs physios you know psychiatrists yeah. asking them to do a whole list of things yeah so it was being mindful of their workload but also how important communication is and yeah. that really I mean in my eyes it's a priority but yeah. it's it's juggling that really yeah yeah sure so when you had that role did, how long did you do that for before you uh, decided to well let, let's let's ask another question what what made you decide to come back to the Isle of Man we always knew some my husband and I we're both from the island um we only moved to the UK because I couldn't get a job on the island so I had right. to drag him with me yeah um so we always knew that we'd come back eventually we want to raise kids on the island we wanted to get married on the island you know our families and our friends were on the island so yeah. it was always a pull when I was at university and when I lived in the UK I always felt lonely and it was not like a lonely that people could fix it yes. was I'd come back, I'd fly back or I'd get the boat and I just feel like this weight lifting off my chest, like <laughs> I'm home. Yeah. And then I'd always feel awful having to go back to the UK. So it was always our plan to come back. Um, we ended up coming back a little bit earlier than planned. My husband was offered a job that we couldn't guarantee would be offered when we were ready. Yeah, sure. So we just had to sort of pack up and, and come home. Um, right. But I didn't regret it at all. Yeah. I, I think working in the UK worked wonders for me in my career. Uh, and my husband as well but I'm just happy to be home brilliant so so what happened how did you end up starting the business did you is that, was that the only way you could sort of get a job in in, in effect or did you yeah. did you start working for social services or uh, no so there wasn't any positions that I was aware of in the government um, right. so it was my only option really to be independent but I'd also 
again, want to work in the area of learning disabilities and autism. So there right. was no vacancies there. So my, my only option was to set up independent. Um, but in doing so, I've now expanded my practice so that I work with children and adults. Right. And I think that's really nice as well that um, I can provide that service for children. And then that's expanding my knowledge base. And um, I, I love to learn. I'm a real geek when it comes to speech therapy. Um, I'll go on courses left, right and centre. I'll do my research. I just love everything to do with it. So I suppose um, working with children means that you can move with, as they grow. You can stay with them and provide that con- continuity. Maybe. Yeah. And yeah. it's lovely. I'm really looking forward to if people come back later on, if another referral comes in, then you can see their progress, see how yeah. they've got on. Yeah, and there are some people who are still on my caseload who have been for a couple of years. There's some people that I'll discharge and, like I said, they might come back, um, yeah. but they might not equally and, and that's that's right. fine. I think I'm looking forward to that moment, you know, when you bump into someone on the street and yeah. you see how much they've progressed and um, how happy everyone is. So. Oh, that's lovely. So how has it been for you during during coronavirus? You know, how how, was, how did the practice manage to um, survive that? The The first lockdown was tricky, I think, because we were thrown into this unknown. Um, teletherapy is an option, and I think it's more in, like, the US, but... Teletherapy, do you mean sort of just over the phone? Yeah, or, well, or... over video. Yeah, um, OK. But it was a really well-known thing, I think, in the US, and some practices in the UK, but we were, as a as a profession thrown into this world of teletherapy and for me I was really scared I I, I was so I'd never done anything like that before I thought you know I'm a really responsive practitioner I'm really flexible if I turn up with my plan and it doesn't happen I can just drag another plan out of the back of my head I've always got toys with me I've always planned for something to not go wrong but something to be different in a session but in teletherapy everything has to be organized and ready to go yes and it seemed so structured and it really panicked me because I've not (laughs) for me I just go with the flow I'm like you don't want to play with that that's fine let's play with something else yeah yeah, but yeah it's difficult and you've just got a screen I guess yeah Yeah. and having to be so regimented and prepared and not not have that ability to be so flexible was scary so I held off for a little bit I did loads of courses. Um, I was doing webinars, you know, I was reading up. I was practicing with my goddaughter to make sure that everything would go right. So I did do some teletherapy in the last lockdown. Um, but I think a lot of people were just nervous. It's it's a new thing. It was a stressful time. I don't want to add any stress on top of people by trying to them f- to figure out how to Zoom works and, you know, having to screen share and mouse share and... Um, for some people it was just easier to say we'll just see you after yeah Um, but I did get access to the government financial support and that was incredibly helpful and I'm really pleased that they were able to offer that yeah so it was a it was a really good support wasn't it yes yeah that's great and it it definitely took a weight off I did spend a lot of time panicking thinking how am I going to work the business you know I, Mm. I didn't really have any clients for quite a while in the first lockdown it was it was a real worry but I think the good thing for me is that I didn't have a premises. Um, yes. And I think that's really cemented with me that I don't need a premises. People are so happy with me coming to their house. Um, I think it's so much easier for them. They don't have to get someone dressed in in the car and find a parking space. And I just turn up and then I leave and they've got all their own toys, all their own books. Everything is there. It's a comfortable space. So although I thought I'd be more professional looking if I had a premises, really it works it it yeah. works fine and people prefer that I come to their house yeah it sounds the most appropriate way to have I mean if you're looking for a business that's professional you're probably looking for another sort of business aren't you you're you know I mean professional services like a lawyer an accountant something or a financial planner although we're not very uh, yeah <laughs> you know we're not we're not exactly what you'd call um smartly dressed here but uh, well, I think these, these are also, but, you know, I know what you mean for yeah. me it's been about person-centered yeah and the people that I work with are in the centre of everything that I do. So if they were going to become distressed coming to a new place that they'd never been to before, yeah. it just makes sense for me to go to where they're comfortable. Uh-huh. Um, there's been some times that I turn up and the parents say, you know what, he's not had a nap. He's really cranky. And I just go, that's fine. We'll just we'll just play because I can still infiltrate a lot of my work into play Yeah. so that they don't think I've turned up and I'm trying to you know make them do things they just think oh this is Ailish she's fun she turns up we have a laugh and then she leaves again and I'm sure that's I'm sure that's a lot of of a lot of comfort to parents who really 
otherwise uh, are having a, a quite challenging time. How was it for lockdown last time? Did you manage to do any, any teletherapy that, so that time? So the most recent lockdown, the one that was quite short, I only had one client um, doing teletherapy, but again, it was straight after Christmas and I think people just valued a bit of a break um and I'm always you know I'll always send emails out with different ideas on my Facebook page always has a lot of different ideas about what people can do at home um I put some videos out yeah it's a busy Facebook page yeah it's uh (laughs) no great but I like for you yeah I like to provide value I think people don't want to be sold to all the time on Facebook so no they don't um what I like to think that I provide is is value and it's it's given people the different ideas of what they can do with their children or adults. Yeah, we'll put links to the Facebook page in the show notes. Thank anyway, you. So that'll be a, a really good resource for people. OK, well, if you don't mind me asking, and, and primarily I do ask this of people in my role as a financial planner, um, what's your earliest memory of money? I was thinking about this question. As a family, I think we were always savers that I was aware of. So we were never an extravagant family Christmases and birthdays were never particularly extravagant we'd get what we wanted and you know we'd be really happy about it when I was older I had a job at 14 and my mum was very clear if I wanted anything she would pay for it and then I would pay her back when I got my wages from like just some holidays yeah it was very clear to save so yeah I think my memories are mainly just saving and being very careful with money and not being too extravagant yeah as far as I was aware, we never lived outside of our means. And I think that's something that I've held on to now. I'm very conscious of, of saving for things and not trying to get too much on finance. And if we have got things on finance, can we yeah. pay it off? Ah, good. Of all the things you've done throughout your life so far, Ailish, what things have you done that have given you the most fulfilment from both a personal and, and, a, and, and a career business perspective? Probably from the business, just just being able to do my job um I I do I I can't say it enough I love my job so much and I just love everything about it I love because every day is so different I love people progressing and like I said I'm so passionate about people being independent if those little steps towards independence creep in um that's just uh, that's amazing um I really do love my job so everything I do professionally makes me really happy I think on a personal level, generally spending time with my brother, you know, we go rock climbing together. We we walk up Peel Hill quite often. We did in the summer. Yeah. Um, you know, we've uh, when I went on holiday with him, uh, my husband took him out double kayaking. You know, right. we 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 are a very active <laughs> yes. family that yeah, we yeah. just think, yeah. you know what, nothing's going to hold us back if he wants to rock climb. I'll take him rock climbing, obviously inside with a rope, but um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah I, I did have I did have visions there at the back of Fenella Beach or something, yeah. <laughs> dangling him off the edge. <laughs> okay, no, thanks for clarifying that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think on um, you know obviously I just really enjoy his attitude, and I think as a family our attitude. I mean, he says I want to go rock climbing. We go fine, let's go rock climbing. We turn up at the rock climbing place, and the guy's a bit. Hmm, we'll we'll just see how this works. But he's you know left a bit, right a bit, right arm up. You know, we work on a clock face, so. Two o'clock, there's a handhold, you know, and then five o'clock, yeah. there's a foothold. And yeah, we just get good. on with it. And he's he's really good at rock climbing. <laughs> Brilliant. Good for him. Good for you guys. That's, uh, that's That sounds fun. So what do you do to relax, Ailish? What do you do to keep your life in balance? So I love the gym. A few years ago, I joined a different gym in Stoke, which was more heavily sort of weight training focused. I've always been a bit scared of weights. I've been one of those people that sees all the buff men in the gym, (laughs) in the weight area and thinks, oh, I'm not going in there. I don't know what I'm doing. But I joined this new gym and I got myself a personal trainer and I learned how to use all of the weights properly. I have hypermobility syndrome, so a lot of my joints are too flexible. Um, I have a lot of muscle pain. But with this personal training, we were able to to move those exercises around so that it suited me. I became stronger. My pain was a lot less. Um, so I get a real a real sense of pleasure. But also, I know I'm doing good for my body going to the gym. So, yeah, Brilliant. I really like the gym. Going yeah. out for walks. Where do you, you know? go? Do you go to West Coast gym? Is that yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I like going out for walks. Often, you know, my brother will take his guide dog out for a walk. Um, uh, but just generally being out on the beach, yeah. down a railway line. Um, yeah. Cool. Just like being outside. Get me outside. <laughs> yeah, the best place for that. <laughs> Tell me, what do you think are the best things about living in the Isle of Man? Absolutely having everything on your doorstep. When we lived in Stoke, 
there was nowhere nice to walk within walking distance we had to drive at least half an hour whereas you know we live in Kirk Michael at the minute there's a railway line two minutes away from our house yeah the beach is five minutes away um we were so grateful in both lockdowns really but especially the first when the weather was so nice that mm-hmm. everything was in walking distance we just felt so lucky we knew if we were in lockdown in Stoke things would have been so much different uh, daily walk would have been round the terrace <laughs> and that's you know yeah. when you've locked down for months yeah that's not an enjoy and you know no. an enjoyable experience whereas in Kirk Michael the railway line's lovely the they're doing quite a lovely. lot of work on, on it at the moment aren't they, are they they're making yeah. the bridge they're rebuilding the oh yeah that's the other end um, right but it's it's tarmacked as well so wow I can take my brother okay. and his guide dog for a walk down the railway lines and know that he's not going to trip up no on anything but um yeah everything being a reach in the Isle of Man and I think this just the sense of community um I love I love it when people ask me who my parents are yeah. um I love that sense of of you know when we grew up in Peel everyone knew us we'd walk down the street and everyone would say hi yeah. my mum would spend hours down the street just chatting to different people we'd yeah. always be looking at the clock thinking yeah. She must have got talking to someone. Yeah. But that sense of community to me is is yeah. lovely. And well, your mum and dad, they were, they were the, the the Celtic romance, weren't they? <laughs> At the time. Yeah, it's they've got a really sweet story. Uh, yeah. She, you know, she moved over from Cornwall to the Isle of Man for him. So yeah, um, yeah, it's lovely. Um, but just the sense of community on the Isle of Man, I, I don't think you can beat it. And no. Although I know a lot of people might have some negative things to say about the Isle of Man. I, I spent all of my time at university promoting it and in Stoke-on-Trent as well, telling everyone how wonderful it was. Oh, you still are today. So yeah. Island Influencers, <laughs> believe it or not, has got a really great download rate in the US. Oh, wow. Which is, um, which is fun. Maybe it's the, maybe it's the, the, the uh, North American Manx Association are all, all getting homesick. Hopefully, you know, there'll be some more inquiries and... You know, some new residents as a result. Yeah. You never know. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I always have felt very lucky to have grown up here and yeah. now live here. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I didn't enjoy particularly living in the UK, but yeah. yeah, this is home. Yeah, I'm with you on that. So, what would you say are the main challenges that the Isle of Man faces? I think. For me, professionally, and this is no criticism at all to the services that already exist, but specialist services are just not present over here. And I understand that because we've got a small population, it's difficult to provide specialist services. But in my line of work, it's really tricky for those people who need or would benefit from access to those specialist services that don't exist. I think that's really hard. And I think it's really tricky as the independent sector to try and pick up the slack there. I I do just, my heart goes out to the parents and the adults and the children that I work with who would really benefit from a a more specialist and more experienced service. But I I understand it's hard with uh, with a small population, Um, but I think that doesn't help those people who really would need access to those services and and don't or have to travel across to the UK. Yeah. Okay. Um, what, so uh, throwing it back at you then, what sort of solutions would you have for those? Um, and I guess the global pandemic has, has shown us that, you know, millions of kids are being taught online. Maybe there is more scope and yeah, that sort of solution. I, I think it's for me, because when I worked in the UK, I worked within specialist services for me, I find it frustrating that I think we've got a small population. We could we could potentially, in theory, do it and do it really well. We've got such a small population, which means you've got a smaller population of people who can access these specialist services. So you can really tailor them and make them amazing and make them really person-centred. And we've got the possibility to, you know, to do that and the do it well. centre of excellence, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but... Again, I understand, you know, budgets are are difficult and you have to cater to the masses. But what I'd like to see is definitely um, a bit more specialism. And like I said, does that have to fall to the independent sector to provide it? I mean, I provide a specialist service for adults with learning disabilities and autism. But then I also provide a paediatric service. Yeah, it is. It is. I think it is tricky over here. And then it's a population issue. But yeah, I just think... Okay, could be amazing. 
Well, um, if anyone's, li- anyone's listening to this who's got some influence that can uh, reach out to you, then maybe they can contact you through the show notes. That would be amazing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so what have you got planned next, Ailish? So at the minute, my caseload is full and wow. I have a waiting <laughs> list. So as much as I would absolutely love to just keep taking clients on and, and just keep working with people, I have to be really conscious that the service I provide has to be bespoke to individuals. So I can't, if I take on loads and loads and loads and loads of people, then I can't provide that intensive service. Um, sort of dilutes, I guess. Yeah. And I enjoy that I can provide the service that people want me to. So there's some children that I see twice a week and that's what the parents want. There's other people that I see once a month. You know, I might review them every now and again, but I'm really conscious that everyone on my caseload needs to be able to have a whole piece of me and if I keep taking people on so at the moment I've had to sort of put a stop to referrals just because again I'm really conscious if my waiting list grows and grows and grows it might be four or five months before I can get to people and then you know that's not the service that I want to be able to provide I want to be able to provide a really responsive person-centered service and if I'm rushing if I can't offer people an appointment for weeks that's not what I want so my aim is to keep my caseload small and intensive and just provide people with the best service that I can provide them with. So yeah, my plan at the minute is to just keep working as I am. So what about longer term? Say you didn't hear from this and, uh, you, you know, is, is there a plan to ultimately grow your business and take someone on to help you out? I have thought about this and I do wonder whether it'd be worth taking another therapist on. I don't know. I, I weigh it up sometimes. I think for me, it's a concern that if I was taking someone on and they're working under my name, if something was to happen or, you know, it's my reputation and I think I'm very, very conscious of that, that yes. I've spent a long time building my brand and working really hard and I can't control that. I'm a bit of a control freak, I suppose, is what I'm trying to say. Yes. I like to be able to do everything and well, know what's going on. Welcome to the world of the small business owner. <laughs> yeah, so... I don't know whether I'm just better suited having a small caseload or whether I take someone on and we can expand. Yes. I'm still on the fence. Yeah. Um, I really don't know. Okay. <laughs> now that's, that's, that, that's, that's really straight up of you. Thanks for, thanks for saying that. Let's, let's hope that um, we, we see more in this space because there's obviously a, a big demand. Yes. Finally, we, we'd like to just finish off for, for our listeners who are in, always interested in, in what, what our, our guests are, are, are learning about. So what, what, what books have you read recently? Or, I mean, self-development or even just a bit of, you know, lockdown entertainment um so i have got on this real self-development kind of i don't know path at the minute i really enjoy the people that i follow on instagram i make sure that they're really positive um so i like to follow michelle ellman she talks a lot about body positivity but also boundaries um which i'm very much working on at the minute um people like lucy sheridan who's a comparison coach so she talks very much about not comparing yourself to others and how to be comfortable in yourself she's got a book as well that i like to read um yeah i'm very um i have a book about mental health um it's called uh, it's okay it, or it's not okay to not be okay or something like that and other lies that people tell you but it's basically a book full of people's stories about their mental health and and how they've sort of worked through it and um i like to keep the things that i'm reading inspiring and working on me I'm uh, you know I'm really trying to work on my boundaries and (laughs) just just be happier in myself um and I definitely think now that I've turned 30 I feel like my 20s were a very difficult time now that I've turned 30 I've got this new lease of life and I think no I'm gonna do things for me (laughs) yeah Um, wait till you get to 40 it's amazing and 50 is even better (laughs) uh yeah I just I, I, I've had quite low self-esteem and now I'm prioritising me and that's what needs to happen. Um, so. Well, I think you're amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Well, so moving on from that, what is your favourite quote? Yeah, so this is a quote I have in my office. So in my office, I have a cork board with quite a lot of quotes on it that I feel really passionate about. But my main one is the Eleanor Roosevelt, um, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. Um, very wise. For me... I went through a period of having really quite strong imposter syndrome and I always I always felt inferior from working in specialist services in the UK. Everyone was more experienced than me and I always felt like I had to catch up somehow and I had to do everything and then working for yourself, you've only got your own 
voice to deal with and and that's telling you you're not good enough because yeah. you're telling yourself that because you've applied a label from your past when you felt that and you're probably looking for evidence to confirm that to yourself yeah and actually you are good enough and you and for me it's always that I'll do one more course and then I'll be great and I'll do one more course and I, I you know I love going on courses and I love doing research but there was that mindset of I'll be better once I do this next course I'll be better once I do this next course but now you know I am I am me. I am doing what I do. Another course, yep, that's amazing. It's another string to my bow, but it doesn't mean that I'm not worthy. If I haven't done that course, if I have to wait and save up for it, that doesn't mean that in the meantime, I'm inferior as a therapist. I am a great therapist. <laughs> and another course, yep, that's great. But okay. yeah, it's given myself consent to say, you, you're, you're fine as you are. Fantastic. Have you had any coaching on that? No. Okay. Um, I did have a business coach for a little bit. I did the micro business grant right. scheme. Yeah, yeah. So I had a business coach for a little bit, but I think, yeah, I'm just working on myself. And <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we we do bring there's there's a school of thought. There is what happens, and then there's what we make it mean. So we believe a lot of things about ourselves that we've applied labels to ourselves that we look for evidence to actually kind of make us believe about ourselves, mm. which actually isn't true. And I'm a massive fan of the Elizabeth Day podcast, How to Fail. I love that podcast because it's all about people talking about what they perceive as failures, but actually how it wasn't a failure. Yeah. So to me, again, going back, I didn't get into university when I was 18. I could have seen that as a failure, but really those two years of working in care gave me so much experience. Yes, and it has. I built so many friendships that I still have now that that wasn't a failure it's not a failure anymore and yeah I'm very clear on, not, it never was yeah <laughs> and everything's an opportunity to learn for me things go wrong I apologize and I learn from it and I don't let it beat me up anymore because that's what I was doing um but that quote for me has been very much you know what yeah I, I'm not going to give myself consent to feel inferior this is this is my life and and I'm the only person who talks to myself in my head every day it's got to be positive because I cannot tear myself down. No, you're amazing, by the way. Thank you. Just saying. So where can people go to learn more about you? Yeah, so my Facebook page, like you said, is really quite active. Yeah. Um, so Instagram too, you're on? I Personally, I'm on Instagram, okay. but not professionally. Right, um, all right. But yeah, my, my Facebook page is where everything goes on, really. Um, I try to make it really varied, but I always welcome feedback. If people want me to post on certain things, do a video on certain things, absolutely get in touch. Yeah, great. I love hearing from people. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm just Gregor, Speech and Language Therapy on Facebook. Yeah, no, is there a website to go with that or an online booking? or? No, I have found that at the minute... I don't want to pay out for a website because I don't feel like I need one just yet. Everything's working. I've got a full caseload and a waiting list yeah. with just a Facebook Sounds page. Like so yeah. I'm trying to stay really lean in the business. Yeah. Um, right. So to make sure I haven't got that many outgoings. Okay. Um, okay. Well, listen, that's a fantastic story. Thank, thank you, you so much. You know, I'm privileged to have heard your story and I'm sure our listeners will agree with me, you know, to, to, for you to come in and uh, talk to us all about it. And, and what an amazing service that you offer the, the, the people in the community, the Isle of Man. So thank, thank you. you very much. No, thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of Island Influencers from Thornton Chartered Financial Planners. To find out more and for useful links, visit thorntonfs.com slash podcasts.